We have two readings this morning. The first is the Easter story from Luke's perspective. It is found on page 90 in the Gospel reading. It's Luke chapter 24. Let us listen for God's word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remem remembered his words and returned from the tomb. They told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with him who told this to the, dis the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. And from the book of Acts, chapter 10, found on page 129. Then Peter began to speak to the people, saying, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in, believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Please pray with me. Lord God, open my mouth that I may proclaim your praise. Silence in us any voice but your voice so that in hearing we may be obedient to your will. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Today, more than any other day of the year, we aspire to magnificence. Today is not a day of common assent to the routine nature of life. The event that we are celebrating today cannot be measured in human terms, like we measure the heat in salsa as average or mild or medium. No, this day reaches out to the furthest limits of our ability to put words to greatness. So to describe the event of this day, we could use words such as magnificent, or amazing, or extraordinary, 
or even borrow from Mary Poppins and say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious because that's what we aspire to today. When we say Christ is risen, we are grasping for the greatest of greatness that the world has ever known. Human beings have a deep-seated need to visualize and make attempts to reach magnificence. The Egyptians built huge pyramids. The early natives of England erected enormous stones at Stonehenge. The Greeks built the Acropolis. The Romans built the Colosseum. On and on for centuries came human attempts at greatness. When the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris burned last Monday, we were all heartbroken. And it wasn't a Presbyterian church, and we didn't have any personal stake in it. Only a handful of us had ever even seen it. But in our minds, it was an icon of magnificence. And part of that magnificence was lost last Monday, and it struck us deeply. A couple of weeks ago, the first picture of a black hole was released. Some of the most brilliant minds on the planet figured out a way to use the whole Earth as a telescope, and the result was pretty darn spectacular. The black hole looks like a gigantic glazed donut, except the difference is instead of us eating it, a black hole wants to eat us and everything else, too. Nevertheless, the picture is amazing, and just the fact that human beings could achieve such a picture is wildly spectacular. Over and over again, human beings aspire to magnificence. And today we remember when it happened with Jesus Christ. Today we take out our dust rag and we polish up the memory of the resurrection and we say, oh yeah, that was also pretty darn spectacular. And we shout our hallelujahs and we sing lift high the cross and we go away feeling like something magnificent has touched us. And it has touched us greater than the pyramids, more awesome than a black hole, more beautiful than Notre Dame, the resurrection of Jesus Christ confronts our humanity and says, there is your magnificence. There is your greatness. Christ is alive. Aspire to that. And today we do aspire to that, mostly. Last Monday, I was tutoring over at School 57. I was helping two first grade boys. And one of them said jubilantly, I'm going to Ohio for Easter. Now, I understand the separation of church and state, and I support the Constitution 100% on that, but I couldn't help myself. And I started asking the boys about Easter. What happens on Easter, I said. And they couldn't wait to tell me. Well, we get Easter eggs, and there's candy in them, or money. Yes, I said, but why do we celebrate Easter? Because we get candy and money, they said. <laughs> but what else happens on Easter, I asked them. We eat dinner, they said. Well, very good, I said, but why is Easter important? Because we get Easter eggs, they said. Clearly, I wasn't getting anywhere with them. And I'd already broken the church and state rules, so I decided to go the distance with them. 
What happened with Jesus on Easter, I asked. And they were silent. And then little Brian said, I don't know. <laughs> with Easter, do we really aspire for magnificence? Or is it just another day to eat candy? The thing is, the resurrection of Jesus and the promise of eternal life is the only magnificence that will last. The pyramids will eventually crumble. The Roman Colosseum is already a ruin. And that black hole out there in the universe, it will eventually eat itself and disappear in the dark matter of cosmic nothingness. In the burning of Notre Dame, we have seen what happens to the height of human achievement. How does the phrase go? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But in the resurrection, we witness the magnificence of life, life eternal. So my guess is, on the same day that Notre Dame burned, a child was born in Paris or London or New York or Indianapolis. And when that child cried for the first time, it had already achieved more greatness than the greatest architects or scientists or engineers would ever achieve. Life. Life is the most magnificent achievement of all. And today God reminds us of the resurrection of Jesus and God says to us, well you think that is fantastic, well listen to this. That life, that eternal life is also for you and you and you. So here's the question. Would you rather visit a pyramid or hold your baby or hold your grandchild? Every moment, life declares its magnificence over everything else. And God claims that life and makes it eternal for everyone. And so this life is what we need to aspire to. Little Brian in the first grade needs to learn that life is more than just finding candy and money and the Easter eggs. And teenager Tommy needs to learn that life is more than just playing video games. And millennial Megan needs to learn that life is more than just meeting up at the microbrewery with friends. And Gen X Jimmy needs to learn that Life is more than just socking money away in his 403B retirement savings plan. And baby boomer Bobby needs to learn that life is more than just feeling guilty about taking a sabbatical. We all need to aspire to the magnificence of life. And we cannot do that until we hold God's promise of eternal life as the greatest of all magnificence. Nothing else in the world comes close to such an extraordinary idea as life that lasts forever. And God gave us this magnificent idea in the resurrection of Jesus. The night before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter had the chance to stand up for something magnificent, and he blew it. He backed off. He gave in to mediocrity. He accepted the fact that life was routine, and then you die. 
And then Peter ran off and hid in a hole somewhere. But then a few days after Jesus died, Peter witnessed magnificence and everything changed for him. When he saw the resurrected Jesus, nothing could stop him from reaching for the greatest thing of all, life itself. And so he went around town telling anyone who would listen, you know what? They put Jesus to death by hanging him on a tree. And then God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. And for the first time ever, Peter aspired to magnificence. And for the first time ever, Peter was not afraid. The world wants to drag us down to its low, low, low level of lowliness. Lies, deceit, indecency, injustice have become the norm, and no one wants to even aspire to goodness, let alone greatness. But today, when we recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are staring straight into the eyes of magnificence. You want something great, America? Discover a life that cannot be consumed by death. You want something great, America? Discover a love that surrounds everyone. You want something great, America? Something that will last? Well, here it is. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is alive, and because of that, so are you. Friends, aspire for magnificence in something that will last, and today, you will bear witness to eternal life. Christ is alive. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen.